All right, good, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to another Saturday Matters. You did get the reminder to silence your phones. Thank you. Um, I told quite a few people that I'm really enjoying doing this Saturday morning program, getting to introduce a, a smart and well-informed resident to speak to you. Extra special today because there's five smart and well-informed people to speak to. Uh, to start off, we're going to have Barry Keane, who is our political expert in residence. Um, Carol, Mitch, thank you, Carol, for being here. Doug Johnson, Bob Gordon, and Joe O'Neill. I don't even know what they're going to say exactly, and I don't know what order they want to speak in, except that Barry is going to lead it off. So. You go ahead, and uh, I'll sit down. I can hear you. <laughs> now that the bar has been set impossibly high, uh, I'll open with my comments, and I'll keep them to 10 minutes. Uh, but before I forget, which is a task that I find increasingly easy to accomplish, uh, I want to mention, I want to thank um, uh, Carolyn Major, who has assisted me in research and in logistics. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Carolyn. But as I say, aside from that, I'll keep my comments to 10 minutes. Unfortunately, Ben Franklin's quote about a republic, if you can keep it, you all know that quote by now, it's been overused of late, but it's so important. Democracy is not self-sustaining. It's a process that's never finished. It's highly vulnerable to loss of interest, to complacency, and inattention. And that said, let's do some basic introspection about our efforts here at University House to stay informed. An intensifying focus on the upcoming presidential election began here in the spring with our currently vacationing neighbor, uh, Charlie Putcomers, and my theoretical debate, it wasn't much of a debate really, over whether President Biden should or could be made to withdraw his candidacy, and if so, how he might be replaced and by whom. At that time in the spring, hypothetical interest was moderately high, but reality-based interest seemed quite low. Biden's withdrawal was considered fanciful. It wasn't. The selection of a replacement candidate was considered impossible. It wasn't. So how in our efforts to live up to the responsibility of being informed citizens, how could we have been so wrong? How could we have seemed so willing to accept too easily whatever was to come? Well, what if, a few of us wondered, instead of feeling our responsibilities were just those of voters, ordinary citizens, what if we imagined we were in charge of significant political decision making? So a few, then a number of us, maybe we were political addicts, began communicating and kicking around ideas, probabilities, predictions, and even some potential strategic designs. So given my background, uh, some some people, friends, uh, family, neighbors here asked me about what I thought the political 
political meaning might be of what was going on, some of the bizarre happenings that started occurring. Well, we had some growing, uh, growing number of repetitive email exchanges that turned into an informal blog that included lots of elicited reaction to published information from the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, from uh, people who, who published uh, their views, their opinions on things. The conclusions that we were reaching departed significantly and increasingly from what had been the predominant view here at University House. The predominant view. Starting in the spring, there developed four assumptions, all of which candidly were dead wrong. <laughs> Let's quickly review them. Number one, Biden won't withdraw. Why would a stubborn, committed, and heavily favored incumbent withdraw? He won't, and we can't make him. That view was erroneously premised on the belief that Biden was on a path to re-election. Some of us labeled undue alarmists worried, and this was before the widespread public panic set in, that he was on a path to defeat and national disaster. Why did we worry? Because we knew that under the Electoral College, two-thirds of the votes of Americans did not count in the presidential election. And the election would be decided by the remaining voters in just six states. We also were paying enough close attention, at least Charlie Putcomer and I, to know that not one or two, but by and large, all the June polls showed Biden losing in those swing states. And we also perceived, and a number of others began perceiving in our meanderings that Biden was a patriot. And though he was stubborn, he was probably capable of waking up at some point, though maybe not in time. But we thought that it was inevitable, inevitable, that to avoid humiliating disaster that he would withdraw. We knew it while most of our neighbors still thought it was a ridiculous idea. Second, it was perceived that even if Biden was willing to leave, it was just too late to replace him. I mean, after all, rules are rules. Expectations can't just be turned aside. Actually, all of that should have been put to rest by the hypothetical that was posed by some of you who were there during the uh, Putcomer uh, discussion. And, and, and what was posed was this, what if a candidate died the day before an election? Do you think a political party would just throw in the towel? Never. Never. So as could have been expected, Biden's withdrawal in July didn't did not paralyze the selection machinery. We knew and we all could have surmised that at least a functioning process was a distinct, hopeful possibility. And that's what happened. But third, most thought that in the primary contest for successor, chaos would be a certainty. Wrong again. Just like a trip to the gallows focuses the mind, <laughs> impending disaster is the foremost crucible of political unity. Our not so merry band of political addicts calculated that, or at least prayed for that. Fortunately, it happened. That way, not a bad bet. Again, the, the profound irony is that Trump's success at convincing his MAGA base of his totalitarian vision so frightened Americans 
and it created the crucible from which emerged an instant, powerful, and unprecedented unity. Behind a new exciting presidential candidate. And that's where we are now. Finally, the prevailing view at the time of uh, Putcomer, Put, Putcomer Keen is in 2015 was the polls didn't matter because in the end people would never think of electing Trump. <laughs> Wrong. The majority did think of electing Trump and they still do. They still do. So all four firm convictions were dead wrong. And clinging to any of them by officially situated decision makers would have put us on the highway to autocracy. We may still be on that highway. Now I've described all of this at a level that's a little too pat. But as a believer of good strategic analysis, I was thrilled at how on target the reasoning process of our little U-House pickup group was. However, in addition to those who originally said Trump can't be elected, there remain a few who think characterizing his victory as an irreversible catastrophe is a gross overstatement who unbelievably still won't take him in his own words. Well, consider this. Most recently, as I think most of you know, he called upon his evangelical Christian audience to get out and vote this one time only. And he added, and this is verbatim, you never have to vote again because we've taken care of him. It's been fixed. It's been fixed. If that doesn't chill the American blood, what will? All of this, and yet we can't take the election outcome for granted. With other resident panelists, we'll talk about why. But first, a few thoughts about uh, VP candidate selection, and I should uh, tell you that at the end of what I'm about to say about that, I'll come out with a prediction, which is 180 degrees from what I think should happen. So what I'm gonna say will be controversial and you won't like it, I think. Okay, my checklist on this, uh, first, governability. Uh, all of the people currently under consideration seem to possess more or less skills of and an aptitude for governance, at least within an acceptable range. They're broadly respected, they're elected to high offices, they're from important states, and they possess recognizable bipartisan ability. Now let's get, get down to potential electability contributions. What will they do to help elect a president who will help defeat a dictator? So that's governability. Second, math. And by math, I mean the math of getting the 270 votes to win a presidential election in the Electoral College. Where is the person under consideration from? How important to the state or region are they? How many electoral votes do they bring to the table? Uh, one might think that gives the electoral math edge to Josh Shapiro, uh, the 20 vote <coughs> Pennsylvania governor, but maybe not. Pennsylvania, with a reputationally revived Biden's help, is likely to go Democratic anyway, in my opinion not in the opinion of many others. And with Gaza, a divisive party issue, and I hope you'll think about this, Republicans will undoubtedly make Shapiro's religion a factor. <coughs> Regionally, Minnesota's 11 vote Governor Waltz is, the, is in the middle of the 35 vote Midwestern Blue Wall. 
Some of you may not know what the blue wall is, but I think most of you do. He's a delightful guy, but is he a strong enough personality? I don't know. In terms of math, I liked Roy Cooper, the North Carolina governor who looked great because his white conservative Southern candidacy would compliment someone seen as a black California liberal. And he would be able to positively influence wavering North Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia. But he pulled out, so he's not under consideration. Uh, can a guy like Kentucky's Andy Bashir fill in and provide as much electoral support? Probably not. Okay, so we got the first two on the checklist, uh, governability and math. Uh, how about image? Who has the most all-around heroic and emotionally appealing image? In my opinion, that edge would go to the 10-vote Arizona's astronaut senator, Mark Kelly. Yes, but he's less attractive on the math and maybe not the highest achiever in terms of balancing out the ticket. Why? Because he's from the Southwest rather than from the Blue Wall or the Southeastern states. And there's something that's even more important. His selection would clearly risk loss of Democratic control of the Senate. The Republican governor would replace him with Republican senator. Fourth, fourth consideration on the checklist, who would do the least damage? Who would be least damaging? Now let me surprise maybe and painfully tell you that this is the single most important item on the checklist in my opinion. As the Hippocratic Oath says, doctor, first do no harm. First do no harm. Think about Vance, J.D. Vance, and the harm he's done already. Think about Sarah Palin, if you can, if you must. Think about Dan Quayle. On the Democratic side, think about Tom Eagleton. Now, I say this is painful because I'm afraid Harris may be about to make a huge mistake. Stop and think. If I asked you about who were the three most emotionally appealing vice presidential candidates, like a lot of people, you might say Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, you might say Jean Raimondo. But adding two women, uh, well, that wouldn't balance a ticket very well. You might say Pete Buttigieg. Now, he's the swiftest on his feet, and he's the strongest communicator. You should know that by now. But no, each on this ticket would drag down Kamala's chances at a very dangerous time. No, no, no to anyone who would drag down the ticket at this point. And I'm afraid Josh Shapiro would. And since Harris will announce her choice Tuesday in Pennsylvania, the chances are it will be him. Now here's my reluctant reasoning. Netanyahu's recent misadventures truly threatened to drag America into a dangerous Mideastern war. Republicans are licking their chops at the opportunity, opportunity it provides to divide American support for the ticket by playing the anti-Semitic card. Trump's ugly minions are already attacking Kamala's husband for being, quote, a crappy Jew, quote, unquote. <laughs> If you increase their opportunity, opportunity by putting a Jewish Democrat on the ticket, forcing, to, forcing him to take a no-win position on Gaza, in my opinion, you've seriously devalued the chances of stopping Trump. Now, maybe I'm wrong, 
And if so, you tell me. And truly, I hope my political calculations are wrong. But you know exactly how vile a human being Trump is. And the best proof of that is what he's done recently to Kamala Harris. Is she really black? Is she really black? I mean, he's attacking her for being black and then says, oh, but she may not really be black. What a vile human being. Well, then who's left? Who's left for a vice presidential choice? My first choice is Tim Waltz from Minnesota. My close second choice that will also make no one happy is Andy Brashear. And why, again, because neither is controversial. Neither is advanced-type risk to the ticket. Neither will risk loss of Senate control. Neither will ignite party division. And after all, we're not now talking about choosing a presidential candidate. We're only talking about a vice presidential one. So shouldn't we first do no harm? I'll end on that bittersweet note. Turn the rest of the program over. Thank you. Well, I don't have various experience, and I'm not a public speaker unless you're 10, 11, 12 years old. I'm pretty good with those. <laughs> so I'm going to pretend you're all my fifth graders. Um, I think this is a crucial election, obviously. We all do. Um, and I'm approaching it from a little different angle. I'm female. And I think that women are going to have a um, really large part in this next election, as we always do. A <laughs> um, little bit of history. In, starting in uh, 1980, which in my head is 20 years ago, turns out it's 44 years ago, um, they could look at registration of voters by gender, citizens who were you know, allowed to register. And at that time, male and female um, residents were both at about 70% of people who actually registered to vote. But there has been a gap, you've all heard of the gender gap, and that has increased slightly each election since then. And by 2022, 70% of eligible women were registered and only 68% of men. Doesn't seem like a lot. My quick mathematical calculation based on the 2020 um, census was that each percentage point is probably two and a half million people. So, two points. And in presidential elections, that gap is bigger. It's 74% of women are registered, 71% of men. So in both cases, we all are more likely to get registered to vote in presidential elections. Um, so it continues to increase. I would assume it would increase again. But being registered to vote doesn't cover the ground. You have to actually get to the polls. So. Turnout is a big issue. And again, there is a gap. In 1980, again, it was, there wasn't much of a gap, a little bit. 61.9% of women, 61.5% of men. But by 2020, and this is just looking at presidential elections, 68.4% of women, 65% of men actually voted that were registered. So you've got the gap on registration and then you've got the gap on actually voting. The largest gap, interestingly enough, is with black voters between the men and women and then Hispanic would be the second group. Um, as an aside, not specifically speaking to women, but we as Democrats are always concerned about the young people voting because they tend to be lean left lean toward the Democratic Party. Um, and that's always a concern because they don't seem to get themselves um, to vote as much as we would like them to. 
But in those first 48 hours, after Biden said he was withdrawing, in 48 hours they registered 40,000 new voters. And of that 40,000, 83% were between 18 and 34. So if we keep that kind of thing up, it's good. Why do I think the number of women voters is so important? Is because other than saving our democracy, which of course is sort of the big overriding umbrella here, I do think that the issue of women's reproductive health is a very large issue in this election. It's been two years since Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court, um, and I don't think women have forgotten that. And I think that that is going to drive a lot of people to the polls and to vote the way we would like them to. Um, and I say women's reproductive health, it's not just abortion, it's contraception, it's problems with a pregnancy, it's miscarriages, it's in IVF, in vitro fertilization, lots of things that surround women's reproductive health. Um, and I think those of us who you know, grew up with good health care are a little taken aback that our granddaughters and great-granddaughters may not have that same protection. Um, abortion rights has been directly on the ballot in seven states since the Supreme Court ruling. In some of those states, and they were Kansas, Vermont, Montana, Michigan, Kentucky, California, and Ohio, in I think four of those states it was a direct um, vote on whether the constitution of that state should include protection for abortion, all past it, Michigan being one of them, and that's where I know most of my information from. Um, the other states, it was, it was the flip, it was a negative, um, it was a proposal to make it easier to outlaw abortions. Those all failed. So in all seven cases, and it didn't matter if the state was a blue state, a pink state, a red state, in all seven of those states, the um, women's choice side prevailed. And I think that says something about our upcoming election nationally. Um, I think it's a losing issue for Republicans. And I think women need to be very vocal. The not going back chant that you hear at um, Democratic convention programs, things that are going on, rallies, um, I think refers to a number of things, but certainly to that issue. Um, and one more thing, it's, and Barry referred to this, it's not just who's registered, it's do they vote. And turnout is essential. And I think our postcards that we were, many of us are doing here, which is strictly a get out the vote, it doesn't tell anybody who to vote for or anything like that, it's just go vote, um, is very important. As is um, the number of volunteers that you've got to man the political offices around. I know in Michigan in the early spring, the Democrats had 30 offices opened with paid staff as well as volunteers. And the Republicans had none. Michigan Republicans at that point had no money. I'm not sure where they stand now, but then they were in a hole. They actually had a loan that they had defaulted on and were in court. They also had two people insisting they were heading the party in the state, so they were a mess. That's a big hole to dig themselves out of. So I don't think Michigan is a swing state. Perry and I had that conversation. Um, Anyway, it takes a massive effort, a grassroots effort, to get out the vote. It's knocking on doors. It's manning telephone or you know calling programs. It's delivering signs for people to put in their lawn. It's all that kind of got to be done, you know, by the ordinary people. And in 
mean, at least in my experience, that's usually about 75% women that are doing that kind of work. So I would encourage all of you, of course, to vote, but also to check in with your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, anybody else you know, and make sure they vote, because I think that's the crucial issue for this election. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> You've got a fast start here today. It's a, a lot of information, and uh, I hope that you're taking notes. <laughs> the uh, election season is underway. As you know, the primary here in, Arizona, in Washington is concluding. It seems a long time till November, but it's not. Early voting is going to start very soon. So start making your plan to vote. If you haven't registered, do so. If you, you maybe you want to fill up a, a group for dinner to uh, talk about options, but do get your vote in because it's going it's to be critical. Now I'm going to talk just a little bit about Project 2025. Now, how many people have heard about 25? Okay, it's uh, you're experts on this, so so maybe I'll just make this kind of short. Uh, <clears throat> As you know, it's a very ambitious game plan for the next Trump administration. Harris is running against it and doing pretty well with it. Trump is running scared. He's trying to deny it. I wonder if he's actually read it. It's 922 pages. It will strip away freedoms and remake the government in a conservative dream. It's a list of policy reforms that would end government as we know it. It would cripple justice. It would cripple the Justice Department, the FBI, and end public broadcasting. Some pretty fundamental kinds of things. Well, it's a Heritage Foundation product. Uh, it's a meld of uh, works of 400 scholars, conservative scholars, and uh, uh, MAGA analysts. And it was, it's a kind of a catalog of uh, who's who and who will be who in the next administration if Trump is elected. It's a summary of what they learned based on their experience in Trump's first administration. All the obstacles that they faced in getting things done They've got an answer for it now. Bringing in the administrative state is the, perhaps their primary objective. Here are a few of their major wants. Civil service reforms will allow the removal of government workers who are not sufficiently loyal to Trump. Well, now think about that. There are, what, 50,000 civil service workers in this country? Trump says, hey, I won't have to fire all 50,000 of, 50, of them. Uh, 10,000 will probably do it. The rest of them will be scared. On taxes, they want an 18% 18% corporate income tax. They want both federal programs that are tied to work. They want to deregulate health insurance. Yeah, they go with the uh, Medicare Advantage, not original Medicare. They want to rev up energy production, and they want to gut the climate change initiatives. Abortion was mentioned 200 times, even though Trump is trying to dodge that issue too. Kevin Roberts, the uh, Heritage Foundation uh, exec, boasted that the second American Revolution that would, be, would be peaceful if, left, if the left allows it to be. Uh, that's good. Think about that for a second. If the, if the left allows a revolution to go, go without the check. So it has very dark cultural overtones. It gives little attention to traditional conservative values. And uh, it uh, uh, is a uh, really a master plan. And, and Think about it now. Is, is Trump really 
uh, a mastermind of politics. <laughs> you know, is he's always been tactical. He reacts to to the next, to the last news uh, out or whoever he's talked to last. Uh, he's not so really a strategic thinker. Uh, so he just dodges and weaves and uh, uh, tries to do the best he can, tries to entertain. Uh, so but I want to think a little bit about uh, will Project 25 actually happen? You know, even if the Republicans control the House and Senate, it's not likely to happen. Uh, we will still have a filibuster, and that will block most any legislation. The bureaucracy that he's trying to control, despite his efforts, will leak and defy uh, Trump's uh, intentions. And, and then again, you can say, you can figure that Trump's staff is likely to screw up and not really be able to implement. But it's, uh, it's nevertheless a uh, uh, formidable statement of what, what the goals are of the MAGA consortium. And so it bears careful attention, and I hope that you'll read all 922 pages. <laughs> the Nation is June's issue. This is um, Kathy. For those of you here, the Nation, yes. <coughs> the Plot Against America is their okay. main issue. Are a couple of quote, here are a couple of quotes you may recognize. They cling to guns or religion or antipathy toward people who aren't like them as a way to explain their frustrations. Second quote, you can put half of Trump's supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> They're racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. <clears throat> so, okay, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, respectively. We talk about Trump as pushing an us versus them mentality. The Democrats do the same. And it's hurting them. So I was interested in an opinion piece in the New York Times, How Kamala Harris Can Win, by Michael Sandel, a Harvard philosophy professor. I'm in the same business. So, um, of course, I appreciate that. Um, he thinks that, basically, that Harris needs to talk to what I'm calling the them of the us versus them, especially working class voters without a college degree. They feel ignored and disrespected. Telling them that they can move up in the world if they only get a college degree ignores the real issues he argues. You can cite statistics that show we're beating inflation, but inflation is not merely about the price of eggs. It shows people, no matter how hard I work or even how much I make, I can't get ahead or even keep up. And then there's globalization the baby of both political parties. It's led to job losses, stagnant wages, deregulation of Wall Street. The 2008 crisis saw bank bailouts, but little help for homeowners. And by 2016, extreme inequalities and weakened labor unions resulted. So Democrats have to address this. Which brings us to Marie Glusenkamp Perez. 
She's a member of Congress from Southwest Washington. She flipped a red district. She's co-owner of an automotive repair shop. And she's a graduate of Reed, Reed College, majoring in economics. Students and professors there talked liberal, inclusive politics. But when she began dating a mere mechanic who wasn't a Reed student, her classmates showed how much they looked down on him. And this seems to have set her political compass. She now objects, for example, to forgiving student loans because it singles out college students. You don't benefit if you aren't a student. Politico.com calls her a blue-collar, Bible-quoting, Israel-supporting, pro-choice, millennial Latina. And they ask, is she the future of democratic progressivism? I don't know the answer, and I'll leave it to you to think about that. Okay, thanks. Well, I, uh, I had prepared a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure you would have enjoyed it. <laughs> but uh, it's 45 minutes now you've been listening, and there's a lot of intelligent people uh, present who have, I'm sure, comments and questions. So I'm going to get to the chase of my presentation, which is, I can predict who is going to win the 2024 election. Um, and uh, it is the candidate who wins the Catholic vote. <laughs> and here, here are the statistics, or the data, that support my contention. In uh, 2004, 47% uh, of the Catholics voted for Kerry, and 52% voted for Bush. In 2008, 54% of the Catholics voted for Obama, and 45% voted for McCain. In 2012, 50% of the Catholics voted for Obama, and 48% voted for Romney. Oh, here we are. Uh, in 2016, Trump got 52% of the Catholic vote. And uh, who was the opponent there? Oh, yes, Clinton. Uh, Clinton got, I think, 40, 44%. And last election in 2020, Biden got 51% of the Catholic vote, and Trump got 47%. So. I predict that that will probably be the telling statistic in this upcoming election, and um, I'm hoping and praying that those many Catholics who voted for Trump in these last two elections will get religion <laughs> and do the right thing, and uh, to quote Franklin, help us keep our republic. Here, here. I rest my case. <laughs> Thank you. I want to ask why J.P. Pritzker wasn't mentioned. I, uh, he's the governor of Illinois, and he seems to be on all the lists, and I think he's a horrible person, so I'm, I'm interested in your response. <laughs> Anyone want to take a chance? Mary, go ahead. Because Illinois, except for your part of Illinois, is heavily democratic. Okay, here I come. So Barry, I think we're 
we're all very uh, interested in this vice president uh, pick. I just wanted to take you back to the uh, evaluation of Mark Kelly. The governor of Arizona actually is a Democrat right now, uh, Katie Hobbs. And so if Mark Kelly was selected and she picked a replacement, I assume it would be a Democrat. Would that change your uh, opinion of whether Kelly should be moved up the ranks? You're right. Uh, my mistake. I, I stand corrected. Uh, on that, would it change my opinion? It would, it would modify my opinion, but would it change it enough for me to recommend Kelly as the primary choice? Uh, not probably because I still think avoiding a mistake is paramount. And, and, and I, th I think uh, although it might not be a mistake to, to appoint Kelly, I think that well, it's, it's a close question. Let me put it that way. I, I like Kelly a lot, too. Um, but th thank you for correcting my mistake. The appointee will only be for two years, and then there'll be an election in Arizona, which will probably bring in a Republican. Well, hopefully by then, Arizona will come to its senses. <laughs> Arizona's kind of purple, you know. It's not as a sure thing that a Republican would take over out of Arizona. Particularly, uh, Kerry, uh, the uh, their current crop is mega denier, election deniers, and so it's not sure that, it, that they would be successful. By the way, I think it, it really comes down to whether or not uh, Kelly would have a big influence on gun control uh, issues. Uh, you know, with his wife's uh, assassination and uh, uh, his gun, gun ownership position. He can be a powerful advocate for uh, gun uh, legislation. So, so it also unite the NRA and raise, help them raise a lot of money. Somebody said there were 50,000 civil service employees. I think that has to be a gross underestimate. There have really, there've got to be at least a million. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's. 10,000 civil service employees that work in the health sector. So I don't know where that number came from. Okay. My question is for Joe. Um, with, if abortion rights is indeed a big issue in this election, how do you see that affecting the Catholic vote? Well, uh, I think I saw a statistic I saw a statistic, I think it said that 60% um, of uh, Catholics uh, favor pro-choice. So if that's true, um, it will affect some Catholics, but they probably would vote Republican anyway. Yeah, two thoughts. Uh, is there any chance with a massive turnout that the uh, swing states won't matter so much? I, I don't think so. I, I, I think uh, that the reason they're so dominating is the balance in those states. Yeah, they, they, they can tip one way or the other. So that's what distinguishes them, uh, not so much the numbers. Okay, thanks. Uh, a comment on the postcards. I signed up for a bunch, and they gave me some suggested uh, text to put on them. And I was seeing Biden is so pathetic that I didn't want to encourage anybody to vote. <laughs> so I've changed my tune, and now I say this election is far different than we expected. It's going to determine what kind of country we live in for many years, maybe forever. So please vote. Thanks. It's a different text, but if anybody wants it, uh, I'll repeat it for you. God help those who aren't paying attention. Yeah. More about the postcards. Thanks. Um, there's a there's some suggested wording for the postcards, 
and of course names and addresses. So you don't even have to think up what to say if you don't want to. Everything that you need is in that packet there and October is the target date for mailing them so you have some time and it's only 25 of them in these packets. So come up and get them. You want to say, Barry wanted to say something and then May. We didn't? Oh, okay. May? I'm concerned that no matter what the Electoral College votes come in, that Trump will challenge if he loses. Are, what are your thoughts on protecting the Electoral College process and maybe the popular vote? And I guess this is a very question. Yeah. Election security, right? You're wondering? Anybody have a comment? Just, just a thought on the election security issue. What, a, what I think is perhaps the biggest threat is that Trump has come up with is his recent argument that uh, you know you know, we don't need you don't need to vote you know we got we got fixed we've got people in the election process now who can keep the election from being certified and that yeah, would we'll throw it into the house and we win. So my question is for Joe O'Neill. Uh, how do you accurately count the Catholic vote? And how do you accurately count the Jewish vote? Uh, please repeat. How do you accurately count the Catholic vote? And how do you count the, uh, accurately count the Jewish vote? I don't, I don't well, understand. Uh, I, I depended upon Pew research for these statistics. And uh, I'd have to check with Pew to see how they, I imagine it's, they go to the census and uh, people declare they're Catholic. I'm not sure how pollsters do it, but the, the poll, Pew Research is a pretty reputable operation, I believe, and I'm using their numbers. Get some postcards. <laughs> <laughs>